So I entered the Mutant Breaks 13 competition and created a song for that. Uh, I made the actual song file available for download, uh, but you should grab the new version of it that I've made available now. Uh, I've cleaned things up, added section headers and pattern comments at the side here. Hopefully they all make sense and you can follow through how the song sequence actually works. The main problem though was in the brass instrument. It was a VST that had to be rendered down so that anybody can play the song, but there was an issue with the second sample, which did not play correctly, and that's been fixed. The song came together uh, very quickly, within three days, and the reason that was able to happen so quickly was because of the previous work I'd done on the instruments. It was for a previous audiovisual project. Uh, the song that was created for it was more spacious, uh, a lot slower. So some changes have been made, but really it functioned as a foundation upon which to do the songwriting and build something very quickly. But the instruments themselves are actually very interesting. So let's take a look. In the drum kit, you have all the various drum samples at the side here. And there are actual separate hits for the cymbals and the toms. While for the rest, there's slightly different sounding variants that just help provide a bit of realism, a more natural sound as the song is playing. All the action takes place in the effects tab. Each type of drum goes to its own separate effects chain. And each one is also sent to its own separate track within the pattern editor. However, as you'll probably notice, there's some extra special attention played to the kick drums here. The reason for this is the double bass drum technique. When two bass drums are played very fast together, that can cause some interference after the attack stage. You get the boomy reverb. And that can really double up when the bass drums are playing fast together. This can cause some problems for the drum mix and also interfere with some of the bass within the other instruments. So you want to create something which will stop this from happening. An easy solution is just to manually or perhaps automatically detect when that's happening and then reduce the volume. But this is Renoise, so we can create something more complicated and far more useful. So what's actually happening? Each kick drum is sent initially to its own separate effects chain, a very short one, with a signal follower, and then just a simple send that will send the actual kick drum audio through to the next stage. But you'll notice that the signal follower, which traces the actual waveform in terms of its volume, and then creates a uh, a signal from that which is sent to the effects chain. This one's going to 3. But you'll notice that's going to the opposite kick drum. This is kick 2 signal and it's going to kick 1 volume. Likewise, if we look in kick 1 signal, that's going to effects chain 4, which is kick 2 volume. That's because we want the alternating bass drums, which happen here. CD, 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 CD which is kick one, kick two, they alternate. And so we want the interference to cross over each other and reduce the volume when that's happening very fast. And that's happening in the kick one and kick two volume effects chain. Each one has a key tracker to start off, which detects when the note is played. And then that will play the LFO. As you can see, it starts off at zero because we do not want to get rid of any of the initial attack. We want that to still pierce through the mix. Then the note starts to fade out. The actual audio will be fading out. It's reversed here in the LFO, but that will become clear when we look at the formula. 
Remember, the formula from the signal, which was tracing the waveform, is controlling B. Whereas A is coming from the LFO. The formula device is something that can be used to create code, or just the more simple formula here that we're using, allowing you to do something far more complex than any other effect in Renoise or Redux. And we have 1 minus A times B. That means the result of the LFO times the tracing of the waveform is taken away from 1, which is the full audio signal. And that is traced to the send amount. Now watch what happens when it's played. So, when the two notes and the audio cross over each other, then the attacks still cut through, but any of that boomy reverb is reduced and not allowed to double up and dominate the mix. It behaves smartly, detects automatically what's going on, and it knows precisely what to do at the right time. For the bass instrument, first take a look at the instrument macros device. This allows me to control various things from within the instrument right here. And so I can use the graphical automation to do things such as this. If we look at the waveforms, the first three are recordings from an acoustic guitar using binaural microphones. It fills out the sound field and gives an extra little bit of realism. The next two are simple slaps. Providing a bit of grit for that initial hit. And of course they're all pitched down so that we're faking a bass guitar, but it works out quite nicely. In the modulation section, you're going to find tons of steppers affecting most aspects of the instruments. And for the slaps, you'll see the two steppers here. They're swapping the left and right channels, giving that extra little bit of variance just for those samples. Sometimes the pitch is also changed, not by a huge amount. And you have the operands here, which allow the pitch to be slid around. However, with steppers, they always play from the last step used. So in order for the song to be played the exact same way each time, you need to do a reset, which is what the reset macro is about. Going back to the start of the song, you can see here that that's performed here and allows that to happen. Within the effects, there's a couple of things worth looking at. The signal follower is attached to the cabinet simulator gain. And this is because the waveforms, when they're initially played, they have their own natural distortion. And the bass guitar should support any melodic stuff that's playing. Admittedly, there's not a lot of that in this song, but when it does, you really want that tonality to come through. But when the natural tone of the, the waveform itself is allowed to come through as it's fading out, then you can ramp up what the cabinet simulator is doing and bring in a little bit more distortion. Back in the pattern editor, you can see there's also another signal follower. This is linked to track 7, which is the next one. So the audio from this track of the bass guitar is affecting something in the next instrument, recycle and repeat. Recycle and repeat is the lead instrument, and it's one of these things that I love to create, where it's barely under control, but the sounds that it produces are very cool. The way it's done, mostly here, is through the decimation. If I want precise, immediate changes, then I'll use the effect column. If I want sweeps, things to slide around, then I'll use the graphical automation.
The bass macro is what's being controlled by the bass guitar track. What normally happens is recycle and repeat. When that's playing by itself, everything's as normal with its own bass. But when the bass guitar is playing at the same time, then the bass gets scooped out, allowing for the bass guitar to cut through more than the mix. I don't think the bass mix is perfect in this song. Like I said, I did this very quickly and I ran out of time when it came to fine tuning this. It sounds fine on headphones, but not so great on speakers. That's just what happens. Looking in the instrument itself, there are two samples. One left and one right, and they're literally just mirrors of each other. In the modulation section, you'll see that the filter is using the decimator, and the frequency is what's being controlled by the decimation macro. Now, before we get into the effects, if I turn them off, you'll hear that the modulation sounds pretty cool by itself. But it's not providing the rhythm. The effects chain is. So we have an LFO cycling through the repeater mode. This swaps through each one of these, which is a different length, and every time it hits back on off, it'll grab a new section of the audio to do the repeating. There's something weird going on here though. Uh, for some reason, the cycle isn't the same each time, the length seems to vary. I don't really understand why this happens, I've never seen this happen with anything else. So I'll need to investigate that in future. So what I've got here instead to deal with this is the velocity tracker, which means that every time a note is played with the recycle and repeat, the LFO resets back to the beginning, and so it's reliable in that regard at least. Since this uh, decimation macro produces a lot of different frequency ranges, it can very quickly get out of control. So we have some things here which sort that out. Uh, a couple of filters, uh, DC offset, why not, and the multiband send. This separates the sound out into low, mid and high frequency ranges and puts them into their own effects chains with their own different type of compressor. And this changes according to what the decimation is. And that helps tame some of that wildness. However, you'll also find in the track DSPs, there's an analog filter. And when the bass gets out of control, this was just a quick stop gap method. Uh, this gets turned on and off when needed. Since we're looking at the brass instrument now, I've brought up the original song with the VST. The instrument MIDI control allows me to use modulation, which is a vibrato here, uh, volume changes, pitch bend if I wanted to, but that's not actually used in this song. Using these allows me to provide some variety when it comes to the extended notes. There's a mix EQ and a signal follower. That's going to the destination of track 9, which is the next one, and it's changing the panning of the mixer. The reason for this is the brass itself is going 15 to the right always. That's a reasonable amount, so the forged organ track, when it plays by itself, it's always in the centre. But when the brass is playing at the same time, then it's getting automatically shifted to the left, spreading things out in the stereo field. And one of the reasons for this, you can see in the actual waveforms. I've generated a couple of fake organ samples.
but also we have the orchestral brass. This is the same as the brass VST. So when they're playing together, they support each other, although the forged organ instrument doesn't actually have a lot of that brass present. So when it's playing, it's not really concentrating on tonality. What it does do though, is support the rhythm of the recycle and repeat instrument. Because what you can see here is the exact same setup as used in that instrument. This allows them to play together in sync and they really grind together and enrich the sound. And it works really well. 